We're here today to discuss Samuel Pepys and the Earl of Rochester, two important figures in the literature of the Restoration period. But it's interesting to know that you will know something here that no one in Pepys' day knew and no one a hundred years after Pepys' death knew. Because Pepys was a major figure in early, the early Restoration period, Samuel Pepys. And he wrote a diary. He wrote a diary in a special shorthand called Tachigraphy, which was founded, developed, in fact, invented by a man by the name of William Shelton in the 1650s. And while many educated people use this shorthand to make it easier for them to write, Pepys also used it to keep his documents somewhat secretive. And what he did from 1660 to 1669 was to write a diary that listed as many details as he could remember about life in England during this period from 1660 to 1669. He includes a great many personal details that he would not have wanted people to read in his lifetime. And some of you who keep diaries somewhat are concerned about anyone seeing these diaries who, whom you don't want to admit to them. But in fact, Pepys' diary was not even known and made available to people until 1812, more than 112 years after his death. So to some extent, it's a very honest, realistic, forthright, even blatant expression of what happened in the period when the throne of England was restored. Now, let me first of all mention a few details of Pepys' life, then a few details of events that occurred during that time, and then we'll talk about what we discovered in his diary. On the screen, you see that Pepys lived from 1633 to 1703. Life paralleled the life of John Locke, the philosopher. He was the son of a London tailor. And at the age of 15, he saw the execution of Charles I. Now, I don't know what kind of experience it may be for someone at the age of 15 to see the execution of a king whom no one ever thought could be, whose life could be taken away by the citizens of the country. But Pepys saw this at 15. Who knows, it may have been as important to his life as getting a driver's license today may be important to a 16-year-old. But he remembered this years later when the regicides were themselves executed, and he watched that too. So he watched these events come full circle. Pepys married at the age of 22, a woman named Elizabeth St. Michel, who at the time was 15 years old in 1655. Now, 15 years old is not a long time is not too early an age to get married in the Restoration period. After all, the Hebrew scriptures tell us that people should be married between the ages of 13 and 18. And so this is a, uh, simply a life reality. Elizabeth was not about to go to the university. She died only 14 years later at the age of 29. And then <clears throat> he maintained a relationship with a Mary Skinner. He never married her, but we'll find out from his diaries that Pepys was not about to be alone. <clears throat> now, Pepys actually worked under Edward Montague, who under Oliver Cromwell was the naval commander. Pepys became a member of the Navy Board under the Duke of York when 
the restoration occurred, and he participated in streamlining the Navy. Now, before we go on, I want to give you inter interject a few other details that are relatively important. I mentioned to you yesterday that Oliver Cromwell died in September 1658. And Richard Cromwell, his son who took over, was overthrown April 1659. And there was an interregnum, a period when there was really no actual ruler of England. But in March 1659, Montague, who was Pepys' superior, went to the Baltic to mediate a dispute between Sweden and Denmark, and then covertly entered into negotiations to bring back Charles II to England. So these operations were being handled in a clandestine fashion, because no one knew what kinds of opposition they might encounter. In October 1659, the officers of the army took over, and the army was literally running England under General Monk. People don't like, didn't like the soldiers governing England, and the <coughs> city citizens mobbed the soldiers on December 6th. So it was very important to bring back a ruler to England, a king, someone who could be placed in control. General Monk moved his troops in January 1660. In April, a newly formed parliament was organized. And on May 11, 1660, a fleet sailed to Holland to bring back Charles II. Montague, Pepys, supervisor, was showered with honors and given a pension of 400 pounds a year to honor him for having brought about and been involved in these arrangements. What is 400 pounds a year? Well, in today's dollars, you take 400 pounds, you double them to make dollars as 800. You multiply it by 10, which is 8,000. And you multiply it uh, by uh, 8, about $65,000 a year he received in today's dollars as a reward for involving himself in these details. Now... <clears throat> Pepys was involved with the Naval Board all this time, and the head of the Navy during this time was the Duke of York, the man who's later to become James II. But in 1678, there was a real problem, and Pepys was involved in a disaster that might have destroyed his career. The Duke of York people were suspicious of because he was an avowed Roman Catholic. And they felt that he was going to support a French-inspired movement to take over England by force. There was, in fact, some clandestine murders. There were some worries. There were worries that the Popish plot was going to take place. And so for period, from 1679 to 84, Pope uh, Peeps had to retire because of these particular fears. And you would have thought that would end the, his career. The Duke of York was implicated, but events worked in his favor. Now, there are all kinds of accusations at this point. Samuel Atkins, who was Pepys' clerk, was tried and acquitted of being an accessory to the murder of a Protestant victim, Sir Edmund Dofrey. Pepys' private musician, Cesare Morelli, was rumored to be a Jesuit. Pepys was accused of being a secret papist. And he, in fact, spent six 
uh, weeks in prison under the suspicion of having sold naval secrets to France. People keep selling naval secrets. Um, one begins to investigate how countries like China gained access to the remarkable satellite systems and the navigational systems and nose cones for navigational uh, 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 space flight developed by American firms. We're always trying to find out how one nation passes secrets to another. But in the end, there were no charges proffered against Peeps. And in June 1684, because the Admiralty was running in Epley, Pepys was appointed Secretary of Admiralty Affairs. And to all extent and purposes, Pepys is credited with having actually developed the modern British Navy. Now, let's talk about this diary that tells us about these events and tells us about them in the most intimate fashion. The diary itself today exists. The manuscript pages were recovered and finally ended up in Magdalen College in Cambridge University. But not a line was quoted before 1812. And the first edition greatly expurgated all the licentious, sexual, and salacious passages were taken out, appeared in 1825. The diary is in a shorthand invented by Thomas Shelton, who died in 1650. And this diary was written between 1660 and 69. Now, just to give you some idea of the scope of the diary, in 1660, he wrote 117,000 words. For this class, you're going to write a 10-page paper, which is about 2,500 words. So if you were to write a diary equal to peeps, you would a, uh, greatly increase the number of wording, uh, the number of pages of wording you would have. In 1661, he went up to 84,000 words, down to 84,000 words. 1662, 105,000 words. 1663, 159,000 words. His most prolific year was 1667 with 201,000 words. And by 1669, his eyesight was getting bad, and he reduced to 50, 52,000 words. He actually stopped writing his diary for a while because of his eyesight, but it actually improved. And so he, uh, he continued to work and continued to be quite a success. Now, if you want to know how he wrote, I'm going to read you a passage just to give you a sense of style. You have a very small selection of Pepys' diary in your textbook. We have a larger selection that you will find in a post on WebCT uh, shortly. Now, when Charles came back from France and brought back his brother with him, England was ready for a reversal of the strict puritanical and rigid religious fanaticism of the Cromwell government. And Charles brought back with him the court of France, loose, lascivious, lustful, looking for plays that dealt with events of love, um, People wanting to see situation comedy, just as we have on television. Charles II himself had a number of women whom he embraced because his own wife was a baron. And he had with these women a number of children, none of whom could legitimately gain the throne. But in 1660, Pepys discovered that the Duke of York, his ward, had got the Lord Chancellor's daughter pregnant. And here's the way he writes it. 
<clears throat> October 7th, 1660. The Duke of York hath got my Chancellor's daughter with child, and that she doth lay it to him, and that for certain he did promise her marriage and had signed it with his blood, but that he by stealth had got the paper out of her cabinet. So he agreed to it, he signed the paper saying he was the father, but he snuck it out of her closet some way. The king would have him marry her, but he will not. So that the thing is very bad for the duke and them all. But my lord, that's the Duke of York, doth make light of it. As a thing he believes is not a new thing for the duke to have done abroad. All members of the court found themselves with women who were pregnant. Discoursing concerning what if the duke should marry her, my lord told me that among his father's many old sayings that he had written in a book of his is this one. <clears throat> that he that doth get a wench with child and marries her afterward is as if a man should shit in his hat and then clap it on his own head. So the idea was, if this is by accident, don't commit yourself to life, for life, to a deed that you <coughs> did and engaged in momentarily. Now, if we're going to study Peeps, there are many ways to look at him. But what I'd like to do is look at him, look at his documentation, his ideas, in the perspective of the greases, what I call the greases. Each of the greases, each of those letters stands for a specific aspect of understanding. The G stands for government. The R stands for religion. The E stands for economics. The A stands for art and aesthetics. The S stands for science and technology. The E stands for education. And the S stands for social behavior. I found this to be a good technique. It's not original with me. Many, many years ago, an instructor of my own uh, provided this formula. Well, let's look at some of the events that occur that Peep's diary provides. Under government, we see the arrival of Charles, May 23rd, 1660. Now what's interesting, of course, and certainly interested in, interesting in a modern perspective, is that after Richard Cromwell's death in April, 1659, it took almost a year to reorganize the government. When we realize that the, uh, the United States, in its Iraq mission, sought to reorganize a government, a government that had never been set up democratically, and has given itself perhaps a year or less to do it, it seems as though it's an impossible task. How it succeeds, history will tell. He talks about a committee meeting on Tangiers on October 20, 63, that is, the Navy was concerned about trade. And one of the trade, one of the uh, problems of trade was the, the issue with the Dutch. England engaged in three wars with the Dutch during this period, and primarily it had to do with trade. Who had a right to trade in certain areas? Who had a right to the seas? 
And we'll see how this becomes a very, very important political and strategic problem in Pepys' time. He talks about <clears throat> the Navy fleet at Gutenberg in danger of confronting the Dutch fleet in the Baltic in September 15, 1666. Now, between the first Dutch war in the 1650s and the last Dutch war in the in 1697, a period of 40 years when these wars were going on, the Dutch at one point invaded this British Channel and destroyed and burned the entire British fleet at Medway. During these, these uh, uh, events, New Netherlands in the Americas transferred to England and was named after Pepys' mentor, the Duke of York and it became New York. In its place, England gave the Dutch a place called Suriname, which you'll read about when you read Afrobane's Oronoco, the story of a slave in the Americas. <clears throat> These become political events. Now, I want to mention a few other e events of government that you ought to know, which are not on the screen at this point. <clears throat> Pepys tells us of the ex expectation of the arrival of the king. He was excited about it. After the king arrives and is greeted by General Monk, in October of 1660, you have the execution of of Thomas Harrison, one of the regicides who had executed Charles I. What did they do with him? They first hanged him, then they quartered his body, and then they put parts of his body on the various entrances to London to warn people what would happen in treason in, uh, in the future. Pepys in 1662, met to discuss the administration of the Navy. And he met with William Penn and various commissioners of the Navy Board. As a government official, he used to meet with people who needed favors. And at one point, he received a gift from Dennis Gauden, G-A-U-D-N, a vittler. A vittler is someone who sells vittles. And every navy and every army needs someone to supply them with food. By the way, the correct spelling of vittles is V-I-C-T-U-A-L. Victual, but you pronounce it vittles. And a vittler is V-I-C-T-U-A-L-L-E-R, someone who supplies goods. Pepys received a 500-pound gift from the vittler. Again, how much money did he get out of it? That's 1,000 times 10 is 10,000 times 8 is about $80,000 as a gift for helping this vittler gain access and supply the Navy fleet. We're very concerned about people taking bribes in government and giving contracts for the, uh, for the goods that have to be delivered to the military. Peeps had no compunction about taking this money. People came to Pe Peeps looking for jobs. There was a woman by the name of Mrs. Bagwell who came to see him November 15, 1664. She wanted a better job for her husband. Pepys was a womanizer. And first of all, he did give a job to Mr. Bagwell, another job, but after he had gotten Mrs. Bagwell and she was willing to sacrifice herself for her husband's future. Pepys talks about Mrs. Bagwell in his diaries. No wonder these diaries were postponed for a hundred years after his life. In 1666, 
Half of London burned down in the London fire. Pepys was worried that the fire might reach his home. He had buried his gold underground, but he, he felt that perhaps the French had caused the fire. That was purposely set because when you begin to look at the political ramifications, uh, the political consequences of events in the Restoration period, at first you found England at war with Holland, and then you found England joining Holland against Louis XIV in France, so that you have this uh, joint effort of the Anglican and Dutch Protestant governments against the Roman Catholic influences of Louis XIV. When you have a mate, when you have half the city burned down, you wonder whether it was arson or whether natural forces took place. There are some people in the Restoration period who thought that natural forces caused the fire. Stephen Vincent wrote a book which dealt with the wrath of God. He believes in providential history. And he said that half of London burned down as God's punishment for the English having executed Charles I. But that's another story. So you have both points of view. But when you, you can have a great deal of paranoia on the one hand when you're living in a time when the Dutch move in and destroy your fleet. Just think of the memories we have of Pearl Harbor. And then you have another idea when you dis discover that someone or something has burned down and is responsible for half the city's destruction. And finally, March 6, 1668, we have Pepys describing the Duke of York and giving us some idea of what uh, he was like. Under religion... August 24th, 1662, the Act of Uniformity took effect. What was the Act of Uniformity? The Act of Un Uniformity required every Presbyterian to preach with the Common Prayer Book, the book of the Anglican Church. If you were not able to preach with the Book of Common Prayer, you couldn't preach at all. And England passed a five-mile conventicle act. It said... You, a preacher may not preach within five miles of his church. Then when people still walked five miles, they passed the ten-mile conventicle act. You could not preach within ten miles of your church. You have to understand again that religious toleration did not exist, even though at the time the philosopher John Locke was advancing religious toleration. Or what did Locke say? Locke said people should be able to practice freely and independently the religions they wanted. He had some caveats to that. He said Roman Catholicism could not be tolerated because Roman Catholics were loyal to foreign governments. France, Spain, and the Church of Rome. So it was because of their governmental links, not their religious links, that they could not be tolerated. He said atheists could not be tolerated, uh, this is John Locke, because they had no system of behavior that governed their ethics. And consequently, because they had no system, they couldn't be trusted and they uh, would not be in a position to bring order to society. Pepys tells us that he went to hear Dr. William Bates give a sermon. He also, on August 62, went to church after visiting a woman by the name of Madame Turner. He heard the minister, William Bates, lecture on Hebrews, verse 20. He thought it was a pretty good sermon. And after supper, he went to another one at Dunstan's to hear Parson Herring, who worked up a sweat, he said. So you have the evangelical ministers as well. In 16 December, on Christmas Day, he complained about Bishop Marley's sermon. He says, 
the bishop spoke of sins, but people whispered that the bishop gave no charity to the poor. So while he fulminated against people in his congregation, he was not following his real church obligations. Pepys also mentions that he slept late on Christmas Day, one Christmas Day, and couldn't make church, but he did get to the king's castle in time for lunch. He also, in August 7th, 1664, saw thousands of nonconformists in chains being led to jail because they were not saying the prayers using the Book of Common Prayer. Among them was a man by the name of John Bunyan who was in jail for 13 years for preaching uh, but not in the Church of England. Under economics, we learn a great deal about the way people lived. Pepys buys a baking pan for his wife for 16 shillings. He buys a book by Samuel Butler called Hudibras, which is a ridicule of the round heads. It's a very famous book of satire. He didn't like it. Oh, he paid a lot of money for it. So he told it to another person for 18 quid. Uh, he paid to have a wig made, three pounds. Three pounds, all right, six dollars times eight is 48, times 10, 480 dollars. I don't know what wigs cost today or hairdos, but uh, how many people are going to pay $480 for a wig? Not a bad expense. He had his hair cut for his wig so it would fit. And he even had a conversation with William Penn about how one should have his hair cut. There are a lot of stories about barbers. I always like to find stories about barbers. Peeps gives us a few. You remember that King Midas had the golden touch? And he found out that everything he touched and ate and swallowed turned to gold. So he pleaded to be rid of this curse of the golden touch. And he did lose the golden touch, but he had his head replaced with ass's ears to show how foolish he had been wanting gold. No one knew that Midas had ass's ears except his barber. And barbers, you know, are very loquacious people. The emperor Aurelocus was, once was asked by his barber, how do you want your hair cut? And the emperor said, in silence. Barbers can't keep a secret. So finally the barber who cut Midas' hair ran out and he just shouted into the earth, that Midas has ass's ears, just to get it out of his system. What he didn't realize is that Earth is female, Mother Earth. Women don't hold secrets. And consequently, the whole world learned that King Midas had ass's ears. I've got 500 stories of barbers I can tell you, but we're going to stop at this point and go back to Peeps. In 1664, Pepys said he spent 420 pounds. All right. That's 800 times 10 is 8,000 times 8 is $64,000. But he saved 540 pounds. He saved almost $80,000. So that was a good year for him. When uh, the fire of London took place, he had buried his gold underground. And he was worried that he would have to dig it up. He had a savings of some 2,350 pounds in gold, right? Now multiply that times 4,000 times 8 is 32,000 times 10 means he had about $3, $3 million by that time. So he was doing all right. Remember, he was Secretary of the Admiralty. Being Secretary of the Admiralty meant... When you captured an enemy ship, you got to share the profits. You got to sell the goods. 
you got to sell the wine. There are many advertisements appearing in early newspapers uh, indicating the numbers of bottles of Claret or Bordeaux captured from French ships now for sale. And you could go to tasting parties first to make sure the wine was good, and then you could buy it, but it was all confiscated material. And Peeps in August 67 talks about how he shared some of these profits. Knowing it was illegal, that is, the money should have gone into the government, but he had access to the profits and the rewards. When you move into art and culture, we see him going to plays. Some of the best pictures we have plays in the period are pictures that are given to us by... Uh, by Pepys. He went to see Ben Jonson's play Epicene. He went to see Dryden's versions of Moliere's play. He went to see plays by Thomas Shadwell. He also viewed portraits of very famous paintings at Hampton House. He liked science a great deal. And I want to mention what the, uh, we have here. Pepys talks about designing a barge and a brigantine. You know, ships have to be designed. It can take years to build, design and build a ship. During World War II, Beaumont, Texas was one of the leading shipbuilding centers in the nation for building ships for overseas uh, use. He talks about disputes about medical practices. One time he was taking his coach home. This is November 22nd, 1663. And it broke down on the way home from the Earl of Sandwich. So he had no wheels. Took some effort to get there. August 64, he looked through a microscope for the first time and saw the wings of a moth and the wings of a bird. We have telescopes at the University of Houston capable of reducing objects 100,000 times, electronic, electric uh, microscopes. Scientists can, involved in some of the finest research in the world. Peeps was fascinated with the wings of a moth and the wings of a bird under a microscope. And he was a member of the Royal Society of London, so he was aware of some of the best experimentation being going on, uh, going on at the time. In June of 65, he talks about the plague of London. This was just about when the microscope was invented. I've mentioned to you that in 65, well, in 65 there was a major plague Daniel Defoe writes a book called The Journal of the Plague Year and describes the thousands of people dying, being thrown in lime pits. Nurses who fled their patients for fear of catching the plague from them, some of whom smothered their patients to put them out of misery. But within 20 years... Uh, within 20 years, the plague was no longer a threat once people discovered scientifically what caused the plague and how bacteria traveled in the blood. He describes the Great Fire of London. I've mentioned three houses burning down and firefighters blowing up houses to form a fire break so that the fire wouldn't spread across other areas in London. I mean, we, we keep reading about fires in Los Angeles and the uh, losses of hundreds of homes that they uh, need protecting. But Pepys has another way of looking at the way these houses burn down. He's looking at the loss of rent to businessmen. He says, by his computation... 600,000 pounds in rent have been lost by the burning of these houses and by blowing up these houses. Now, remember, this is a man who's a businessman. He's making his, 
he's, he's developing a perception. And his perception is the way he sees the world developing and the way he sees himself surviving. And then, of course, he describes the scientific technology involved in the Dutch wars, the kinds of ships you used, what happens when an entire fleet is destroyed and you have to build from scratch. He describes his medical problems in, 19, in 1667. He had a cold. He said he was sickly, couldn't control himself. He says his wind, he, had, he was full of wind, and his anus was knit together so that he couldn't eliminate as easily as he should have. His eyes were going bad in 1669 when he finally decided to stop writing this diary. In the field of education, he has read Thomas Fuller's History of the Holy War, story of crusades. At his office in 1662, he practices arithmetic. This is how he gets his education. You ask yourself, what is your education? If you were living in Peep's day, at the age of 12, you would learn uh, Latin. At the age of 14, you would be no Greek. You would read the Iliad, the Odyssey. You would have read the Bible. You would have had all this information. And by the time you entered Oxford and Cambridge or Trinity or the universities, I'm assuming you were Anglican, uh, you were fluent in the classical languages. He read over poems by Abraham Cowley. We're not going to read Cowley's poems this class. It's primarily 17th century material. But the poems were given to him by Cowley's brother. And we never really remember the great poets or famous poets have family and brothers. The Peepsian Library, which exists at Madeline College today honors his reading, his education, and his life. Now when we move into the last category, social behavior, you get a great deal out of the Peep's diary that you wouldn't otherwise get. Now remember, it's a diary, but it's not altogether spontaneous. There are examples of different types of papers being used, and even examples where Pepys would write down what he thought and then rewrite it. So what you have is the articulation of ideas well expressed, not hastily done. That's the way you all should write. You should think a good sentence. Don't write to revise necessarily, although you will have a chance to revise. But always write to put down a good sentence the first time. Think a good sentence. Let the good verbs, the good nouns come out. Avoid the use of the word thing, which has no intrinsic meaning. Avoid as much as possible beginning sentences with TH words. And then when you sit down to write, before you write the sentence, think it out. And write down the best sentence you can, so that when you finish writing, your revisions, while they may be important, are minimal or at least substantive and not accidental. Now, what did he tell us about the way people lived? He talked about the king's diet in 1660. The king ate peas and pork and boiled beef. picked up the Houston Chronicle today and it said that there are restaurants in this city that claim they're selling veal dishes but they're actually substituting pork. And it's very, very offensive to people who follow religious ritual rules that forbid the use of pork and they don't understand that. And so there's several restaurants in the city 
that are being investigated for, having, for substituting meats of this sort. But this wasn't a case with the King of England. Uh, pork was something that you could keep salted and you could, uh, because you did not have refrigeration in the restoration period, right? Pepys tells us in May 25th, 1660, when the King of England came to, when the King came to England, that his dog defecated on the deck of the ship. Now, when you begin to get into that detail, you begin to realize that here's a man who sees everything as being important and nothing as being irrelevant to experience. How did you come to class today, Miss Crockett? By a what? By a bus. All right. Trailway bus, city bus. A shuttle bus. Okay, well, what we're asking is something more explicit. Peeps would have been very explicit, you see. How did you get to school today, Mr. Dickerson? Okay. Uh, did you drive a Plymouth Voyager? Did you drive a Lexus? Did you drive a Cadillac? Did you drive a Kia? What did you drive? A Buick. All right, a Buick. Was it an old Buick with the high tail fins from out of the 70s? 1990 Buick. All right. Peeps would have told us what he drove, what style it was, what year it was. If he tells us what the dog does on the ship, on the deck, on the deck of the ship, at the momentous moment when the king returns from France through Holland, he wants you to, us to be specific. No one drives a car. You drive a specific car. No one drives the same highway. You drive... Brazewood to 610 to Scott Street, and then you switch to McGregor. You're always doing something in a very explicit fashion. And you're doing it in a very unique fashion because each of you comes to school in a different way. And Peeps is this explicit. Peeps has a lot of problems with his wife. He gets very mad at her. In one of his uh, comments, he gets a he's angry with his wife and he kicks and breaks a basket he had bought for her in Holland. Now, whether he's abusive, we're not sure, but you'll hear some other things. He does tell us on November 3, 1661, that he and his wife ate a pullet hen, ate pullet hash for supper. But on August 17, 1662, 1662, he went to Madame Turner's and made a date to dine with her and then he went to church. On 27, 1662, his wife returns home and uh, finds him with a maid on several occasions. On each occasion, the maid was forced to leave, and Peeps was very upset that the maid was forced to leave. Peeps didn't like his wife's parents. He had in-law problems. He said they didn't have any money. They were poor. He didn't like anyone who wasn't poor, and he had to offer them some support. That seemed to grate on him, giving them money. October 24, 1662, he claims that he's sporting in bed with his wife. And he, on num numerous occasions, finds we find him sporting in bed with his wife, with his maid. Uh, we're not sure about Mrs. Turner. October 24, 1662, we find out that Charles II marries Catherine of Braganza. And she's the daughter of King John IV of Portugal. This is a very important marriage. The queen knows of the king's mistresses, but she ignores it. I don't know how many wives of leaders of countries ignore their husbands' trysts with mistresses. 
Fortunately, we'd never have problems like that in American politics. We find out that he enjoyed Christmas supper in 1662 of plum porridge, roasted hen, and he even bought a mince pie from a store to bring with him for dinner. One of his servants, Sarah, was discharged from the household was, was discharged from the household for saying nasty things to William Penn about Pepys and his wife. Drive, driving in a stagecoach can be somewhat dangerous in the 18th century. You can have hijackings. You can have people accost the coach. And October 20th, 1663, Mrs. Pepys was accosted in her coach by a rapist who tried to attack her. He was beaten off by the coachman. And Pepys reports this action too. In December 1662, his wife is mad at the maid Jane and is obliged to dismiss her because she found Pepys with the maid. Well, this goes on and on. I've mentioned to you his affair with Bagwell's wife. In August 1665, Pepys is in bed with his wife and he talks about how they are discussing the poverty of her parents and his, uh, I'm sorry, the poverty of his parents and his sister Pauline, who's 24 years old. But Pepys' wife is pleased that Mr. Godden the Vittler had given Pepys some money. We see people in the household playing the harpsichord. We find out in 1665 that Pepys has bought his wife a necklace of pearls. Pepys, in, 16, in the same year, speaks admiringly of Mrs. Harsley, and he propositioned her on August 5th. Pepys talks about his fear of being burglarized. With all this money hidden, this becomes a problem. And at one point, Pepys refers to going to the playhouse with his wife and Mrs. Pepys' companion, Deborah, Deborah Willett. Deborah Willett joined the household in September 1667. Mrs. Pepys caught Pepys making love to her, and she departed in 1668. Well, we can go on. And you ask yourself, is this literature? If you don't consider it literature, it's well written. It certainly is the material of which literature is made. Now I want to move on to a, a second speaker. This is a, a second writer. This is the Earl of Rochester, John Wilmot, the Earl of Rochester, who was an interesting fellow in the Restoration period. Rochester was one of the members of the king's court. He had made a name for himself fighting in the navy. And he became one of the courtiers that surrounded Charles II. He wrote poetry celebrating the revelries, the good life, the drunkenness and the lasciviousness of the court of Charles II. He's written a number of poems that we uh, 
ought to look at. First of all, Wilmot is John Wilmot is the second Earl of Rochester. He lived from 1647 to 1680. In 1680, he was described this way in a book called Some Passages of the Life and Death of the Right Honorable John Earl of Rochester. He was a graceful and well-shaped person, tall and well-made, if not a little too slender. He was exactly well-bred and what by a modest behavior natural to him. He had good conversation. He was easy and obliging in his conversation. He had a strange vivacity of thought and vigor of expression. His wit had a subtlety and sublimity. Both that were scarce and imitable. He was a man who was involved in the Dutch War. He was in love with a woman by the name of Mallet, M-A-L-E-T, and her parents forbade the marriage. He nev nevertheless ran off with Miss Mallet and married her in 1667, and then was added to the House of Lords. So, defying the parents, running off with a daughter, did not in any way hurt his career. But he's written some rather interesting poems. And one of the poems I'd like to look at is, is in your book. And it's called A Satire Against Reason and Mankind. Now you'll find this on page 464. What he's doing here is giving us a typical satire. Something's wrong with human beings. He's going to tell you what's wrong and hope they can correct their faults. He says, I wish that I could be any animal in the world except man who claims he's rational and is not. And the poem begins this way. Were I who to my cost already am one of those strange, prodigious creatures, man, a spirit free to choose for my own share what case of flesh and blood I please to wear. I'd be a dog, a monkey, or a bear, or anything but that vain animal who is so proud of being rational. Now, of course, he lived in a life that pretty much ignored rationalities. He lived for lust. He lived for love. He lived for sword fights. He found himself in more fights than one might expect. And so he begins to discuss in this poem what human beings are and what makes them unreasonable. Now, it's a, it's a relatively long poem of some 225 lines. There are others that will be up to a thousand lines. But I'm going to pick out some lines here just to give you some idea what he's saying. We know that Locke speaks about the senses. You learn from your senses, not from some spiritual force above. John Locke said that we are born as a tabula rasa, a blank page. And this page fills up with information and ideas that shape our lives. The idea of the tabula rasa differs from the idea of divine inspiration. And when we talk in the 18th century, in the Restoration period, of sensationalism or sensationalist behavior, it's all behavior based on the senses. We're not talking about something that's extravagant or particularly unusual. He says this, the senses are too gross, and he'll contrive, that is man, and he'll contrive a sixth to contradict the other five. And before a certain instinct, we'll prefer reason, which 50 times for one does err. Reason leads us astray. Reason leads us into paths 
that we think we can avoid but encounter otherwise. We try to think philosophically, he says, but philosophy is not the answer if it's in the abstract. He says, our mind leaves the light of nature sense behind. Pathless and wandering ways it takes through errors, fenny bogs, and thorny breaks. Why is it that people of good sense fail? Why is it that people of good sense make the wrong decisions? Why is it that people with power take avenues that seem to ignore rational processes of understanding? What is it about human understanding that denies rational behavior? He says, the misguided follower climbs with pain mountains of whimsies heaped in his own brain, stumbling from thought to thought. He falls headlong down into doubts bound the sea, where like to drown, books bear him up a while. So those of you who didn't know what you were doing before you came to university, you didn't know what careers you wanted to follow, we will try to sustain you for four years. And hopefully, when you leave, you won't drown as this man is drowning, falling headlong down in doubts bound to sea, where like to drown, books bear him up a while and make him try to swim with bladders of philosophy bladders of philosophy that's almost an obscene image such as whatever you learn you're going to eliminate at some point and it'll be of no use to you why do people depend on rationalism why do they depend on reason in hopes still to overtake the escaping light the vapor dances in his dazzling sight till spent it leaves him to eternal night. You want to learn. You want to do better. And the more you learn, the more you feel you have yet to know. Education for some people becomes a desperate search and a frustrating search because as you expand your ideas, your ideas need further expansion. But what happens when you reach the end of your life and you've been disappointed. Then old age and experience, hand in hand, lead him to death and make him understand after a search so painful and so long that all his life he has been in the wrong. How can you live a life and then finally know at the end that it's all been wrong? Huddled in dirt, the reasoning engine lies who was so proud, so witty, and so wise. He calls man a reasoning engine. Miss Charles, what do we think a reasoning engine is? A re he calls man's mind, man, a reasoning engine. Yeah. Constantly turning around, right? constantly turning around your problems. Well, first of all, you're mobile. So you have arms and legs, and you can propel yourself. You become an engine. This is before the steam engine was involved, but there are ways of mobilizing. And you're a reasoning engine because you have the ability to determine where you're going to go. And since an engine is mechanical, it should function very perfectly. It should, it should function perfectly. But something happens in the mind, and this engine moves in directions that are totally irresponsible, totally irresolute, and finally failing. What causes these problems? One of them is pride. Pride drew him in. As cheats their bubbles catch and made him venture to be made a wretch. I want to mention something here. These words rhyme in this poem. Catch and wretch don't rhyme, right? They should. But you've got to think Irish. 
And so I'm going to read it to you the way you should probably read this rhyme. It goes like this. Pride drew him in as chites, the bubbles catch, and made him venture to be made a, rent, a, 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 excuse me, a wretch. Catch and wretch become the word. You don't say catch or catch. Sometimes in the South it's a double syllable word, catch. Catch and wretch. Anytime you see the rhyme doesn't rhyme, think English or think Irish in the 18th century and make sure it rhymes. They all rhyme. There's no, there's no such thing as a sight rhyme in 18th century Restoration literature. Pride drew him in as cheats their bubbles catch and made him venture to be made a wretch. His wisdom did his happiness destroy aiming to know the world he should enjoy. Some people overreach. You want to figure out how the world works. You want to study the mechanics of the bee. You want to study the mechanics of the ant. You want to study the way the meteors flow. You want to judge when the planets are going to arrive. You're going to try to even time the arrival of the planets, such as Halley's planet. So you become transfixed with the frustration of not being able to know the world when what you ought to do is enjoy it. Now, we're going to move from that poem to another poem called Signor Dildo on page 471. A dildo is a device that substitutes for the male phallus. And uh, uh, Rochester dedicated this poem to Charles the Second. Charles was known for having a lot of women. First of all, Catherine of Braganza, his wife, was barren. So whom did Charles entertain, this king of England? Lucy Walter was the mother of the Duke of Monmouth. We'll read about him in another poem. She also had a daughter named Mary, who also claimed to be the child of Charles II. Barbara Villiers, V-I-L-L-I-E-R-S, was the mother of six children, five of whom were acknowledged by Charles to be his children, three boys and two girls. Nell Gwynne, the famous actress. Remember, in Shakespeare's day, only males acted on the stage. By Charles's day, women were on the stage, and one of the reasons women were on the stage because Charles' most famous mistress was Nell Gwynne, the mother of two, Charles and James. Maul Davis was the mother of Mary Tudor, apparently Charles's daughter. Louise de Queruel had one son, presumably by Charles. Elizabeth Killigrew had a w w child by the name of Charlotte Jemima, apparently by Charles. Catherine Peggy, uh, had a son known as Don Carlo. No less than four of the king's sons were named Charles. Two of them were James, one was Christian Henry, another nicknamed Harry. His daughters were Charlotte, Anne, or Mary, but they were not the future queens of England who were the daughters of James II, not Charles. This is the story of King David. The king must procreate. Remember in the Bible it says David was old and cold? Well, when the king was cold, that means he could not procreate anymore, therefore he was useless. What did the Hebrew people do? They, they brought in a young girl by the name of Abishag to try to stimulate David, and she failed. And David was doomed to die. Abishag then goes into Solomon's court. So the idea that the king should be able to have many mistresses or many children was a, uh, understood. Thomas Jefferson, many years later, when he had a love affair with Sally Hemming, his black slave, and had children by her, was accused of trying to populate America with democratic votes. 
And they, uh, of course, that's a very famous story. Well, if you look at this poem that uh, is in your text, it's really a fun poem. It actually resulted, it was one of the reasons why Rochester was dismissed from the court for a year by insulting Charles, by openly claiming to announce what he was doing in private. He says, you ladies all of merry England who have been to kiss the Duchess's hand, pray did you lately observe the show a noble Italian called Signor Dildo. The Signor was one of Her Highness's train and helped to conduct her over the main. But now she cries out to the Duke, I will go. I have no more need of Signor Dildo because she's going to go with the King. And the poem begun, begins as a celebration of the king. We're going to conclude with another poem on page 469 of your text called The Disabled Debauchee. This is a man in love who no longer can gain the pleasures he had because he has contracted the pox. The pox is venereal disease. And this is always a problem in England. But in the, court of rest, the restoration court of, James, of, of Charles II, there was a doctor by the name of Condon, C-O-N-D-O-N, who came up with a device to achieve birth control by sewing together the intestines, sheep's intestines, as a protective device. And so the court of Charles was famous for not only the corruption of the stage, but the corruption of the physical frame. And when Rochester talks about the fact that people disallow reason, uh, love, of course, is one of the reasons why people become irrational. Nothing controls them when they are in love. And here is the disabled debauchee in this poem. This is done in quatrains. Every four lines becomes a, a, a set statement. As some brave admiral in formal, all right, as some brave admiral in former war deprived of force, but pressed with courage still, two rival fleets appearing from afar crawls to the top of an adjacent hill. He can't do much else. From whence, with thoughts full of concern, he views the wise and daring conduct of the fight, while each bold action to his mind renews his present glory and his past delight. So here's an old man trying to reinvigorate his youth, his military action, by watching a battle on, on the river. From his fierce eyes... Flashes of fire he throws, as from black clouds when lightning breaks away. Transported, he thinks himself amidst the foes, and absent yet enjoys the bloody day. So in his fantasy, he sees the battle, and he sees himself involved in it. But he no longer can, because he says this. So when my days of impotence approach, and I'm by pox and wine's unlucky chance, driven from the pleasing billows of debauch on the dull shore of lazy temperance. My pains at least some respite shall afford while I behold the battles you maintain. When fleets of glasses sail about the board from whose broadsides volleys of wit shall Rain. What he's saying is this. I see these battles occurring on the battlefield. I see the fleets fighting in the waters. There are battles to be fought at the dining room table with glasses and wine and human beings who find themselves in conflict or who find themselves in consort one with the other. No wonder Rochester, Rochester tells us that the human reason is 
fallible, and men have reason to regret their lives. Well, it's been a good day. I look forward to seeing you next time.